So Hebrews chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Our second reading may be found on page 598 of the Church Bibles. It's Psalm 93. Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, for evermore. So Psalm 93 begins, the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns. These are familiar words to many of us, I expect. Words that many of us know, words that we believe. Yet it's certainly my experience that the reality that the Lord reigns is just not always that close to the front of my mind. It's something that easily drifts away. I forget it. Perhaps that's your experience as well. Well, Psalm 93 this morning is going to give us time to really think about what it means that the Lord reigns. And to help us with it, the psalmist paints two vivid pictures for us. In verse 1, we're shown inside the throne room and we're directed to look at the robes. The Lord reigns. He's robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. And then in verses 3 and 4, we're presented with pictures of waters. Floods and crashing waves. The floods have lifted up, O oh Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. They've lifted up their roaring. And these two pictures hang side by side in the psalm to help us grasp more deeply the Lord's powerful government of the world and to show us how good it is that the Lord reigns. So let's start by looking at the robes. This is our first point. The Lord reigns reigns. Psalm 93 is a psalm for all times. It's got no author. It's not tied to a specific moment in history, but it's a psalm to direct God's people 
to recall and to think about his sovereign rule over all the world, wherever we are and whenever we are. But of course, as a psalm for all times, it is therefore a psalm for specific times. We find it placed in book four of the Psalms. And here it's applied to God's people Israel as they're reflecting on the lowest point of their history. After great patience and forbearing, the Lord, well, he had given his people over to conquest by the Babylonians. Conquest because of their relentless rebellion against him. At the end of Psalm 98, we, we get that despair captured as, as they, the psalmist writes, How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Israel recognized their sin. They recognized they deserve punishment, but what should they do? They need to look to the Lord. Psalm, uh, book four of the Psalms is full of declarations about the Lord. It's a bit like a kind of doctrine of God in song. It helped Israel by recalling to them who the Lord is, what he has done, so they would look to him alone and they would look to him to bring them home. And that's what Psalm 93 is doing for us this morning. It's putting the focus right on the Lord. Did you notice in the psalm, it's five verses long and five times it uses the name, the Lord. And it's the name of the Lord in block capitals, which in these Bibles represents where in the Hebrew it would be Yahweh, God's personal name. And that's significant. It's not just uh, that any God reigns. It's that Yahweh reigns, the Lord It literally means, Yahweh, I am who I am. Watch me and know me. The Lord revealed his name through the Exodus, through great work of saving his people out of Egypt and bringing judgment on Pharaoh, who stubbornly refused to recognize the Lord reigns. And as you read the Exodus, you see the Lord's name unfolded. You see his character revealed And it's a great summary towards the end of the book. We find him describe himself to Moses as the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. You see, for the Lord to reign, is really good news because we know his character. The king of the world is perfectly just and yet he's also merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. No other is like him. No human ruler even compares to him. I was chatting to a friend uh, a little while back and they just challenge me to think day to day, who do I think God is? What do I think he's like? I guess it's one thing to think that God is there, that he's big, that he created the world, that he rules it. But sometimes our view of God gets a bit out of line with, with what the Bible tells us. And so maybe we think he's distant, that he's not that interested in us. So we aren't sure it's such a good thing that he's in charge. Psalm 93 says, no, it is the Lord who reigns. The Lord who has revealed himself in the Exodus and in the pages of scriptures. Deeply good, just, merciful, unchangingly faithful. And the phrase, the Lord reigns, well, it comes up a number of times in the Psalms that follow this one um, in Psalm 95 and, and onwards. And in this exact form, the Lord reigns. Well, it only comes up in the Old Testament here in these Psalms and in 1 Chronicles 16, which is where David returns the ark to Jerusalem. The ark was the box that contained the Ten Commandments, which represents God's covenant promises with Israel. And when it arrived, David proclaimed, the Lord reigns. Here's what one writer points out about it. 
They write, the declaration the Lord reigns is saying something more than just God is in control. It proclaims that the God of the covenant rules the world. In other words, the God who made wonderful promises, which are fulfilled in Jesus Christ and available to anyone who comes to him, he rules the world. If you're looking in on Christian things this morning, can I say if your view of God is anything less than one of utter wonder at his purity, his justice, his generosity and complete faithfulness, then you haven't understood who the Lord is. You may have rejected an idea of God, but that's not the true God. The Lord reigns. It is really good news. And as we look at him, well, the psalm directs us into that throne room and we gaze at his robes and we see he is a majestic king. Some of us will have seen the pictures of the queen's coronation. Her robe, six yards long. The robe of crimson velvet. It was carried by six maids of honour. Heavy, impressive and beautiful. A symbol of power and majesty to set her apart as monarch. But the Lord is not robed in a symbol of power and majesty. He is robed in majesty itself. Unique in royal power, wisdom, righteousness, beauty. All the glory is his. And then this amazing repetition. He's robed in majesty, verse 1. The Lord is robed. And it's as if we zoom out from having been focused on the robe. And now we look at the whole scene. And the Lord robed in majesty, well, it's as if he rises up to pick up a new garment. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. But this belt is no accessory. This belt is a statement of intent. Literally, he's girded himself up for war. The same word, it comes up in Isaiah to describe the way God prepares King Cyrus to go and rescue his people out of Babylon, just as he promised he would. It's a word of action, of covenant faithfulness. The Lord reigns. He is majestic and he is acting on his promises. We need this psalm because it can be so easy to just lose sight of the fact that the Lord reigns and he feels distant, not really that involved in the world, not really that involved in our lives. But no, the rule of the world does not neglect his world. He has his belt on, ready to act, ready to act powerfully on behalf of his people. What comfort for the stressed Israel? The Lord reigns. He will act for the sake of his name, keeping his covenant promises. On many occasions, I've had that experience in a Bible study, perhaps some of you have had this, where somebody says something and then suddenly it all kind of clicks and it makes sense. And you think, ah, I get it. And then implications flow and they follow. Well, the last line of verse 1 is a bit like that. Yes, the world is established, it shall never be moved. It's as if the psalmist writes, having seen the Lord reigns. Well, of course, it makes sense. If the Lord reigns, well, then no other power can alter the fabric of the world. It's his. The world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. Human powers have various influence in the world. Sometimes it seems very great, but they didn't start it. They didn't create it. They can't stop it. And they can't change the way it works because the world is established by the Lord. In fact, he was there before it. Verse 2 again, your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. When the queen was crowned, she was given the throne. She was next in line and she was allowed to sit on it. But there was no coronation for the Lord. You are from everlasting, says the psalmist. The Lord is eternal. Far from being a coronation, the Lord created the throne to rule what he has established. 
And so its beginning and its end is in his hand alone. And the whole way the world works and its fabric is by his will and his wisdom. If you look down at verse 5, we see, again, the psalmist says, Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. The world is established on the decrees of the Lord. It won't change. He rules it by them. The rising of the sun, the movement of the wind, every detail, every breath, the rise and fall of nations. Imagine being an Israelite far from home, having felt the force of Babylonian conquest, political powers so strong, the world feeling shaken up. Psalm 93 says, look at the robes. The Lord reigns. The world is his. It rests on his decrees. He acts in salvation and judgment. He raises up and brings down rulers. He brings justice. He rules in wisdom. I was speaking to a neighbor recently at a barbecue, and, and they were just saying, as we come out of pandemic, the world seems out of control. Political powers, what are they doing? Economic powers. They were expressing all of this kind of concern and uncertainty and this general sense of just feeling really unsettled. Psalm 93 is such good news. Other powers can't stop the world. They didn't start it and they don't determine how it works. The world works according to the Lord's decrees. He is active. His belt is on. He's keeping his promises. Look at the robes. The Lord reigns. And so we have our first picture in the throne room, the picture of the robes. And then in verses 3 and 4, we move to our second picture hanging beside it. And this is the picture of the floods. The Lord reigns our first point, second point, so we are safe in the floods. Verse 3, right in the center of this psalm, is a cry for help. The floods have lifted up, O oh Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Knowing that the Lord reigns, while the psalmist calls out to him in the midst of the floods, and he describes a picture of immense power. The way it's written sort of conveys the rising water. The floods have lifted up. They've lifted up their voice. They've lifted up their roaring. And it seems a power that's unstoppable. It seems overwhelming. But the, farmer, the psalmist then follows this cry with another declaration in verse 4. And it works in contrast. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. This great noise, lots of powerful waters, unstoppable, it seems, will not overwhelm the Lord. Three times we're sold he's mightier, matching the floods. The floods lift, lift up their voice, lift up their roaring. The Lord on high is mightier. He is mightier. He on high is mighty. The Lord reigns with a power that is greater than perhaps the most powerful force that can face humanity. The RNLI every summer produce campaigns to warn us of the dangers of seas and rivers. There is a sense that rushing waters and thundering seas carry a power that humanity has just never been able to tame. Yet the Lord is mightier. His power is far greater. He can calm a storm with a word. We suggested that the picture of the robes and the floods are hanging next to each other in the gallery. And the floods is a terrifying, vast canvas. But compared to the picture of the robe, it's tiny. When Isaiah saw a vision of God in the temple, just the corner of his robe filled the sanctuary. As we hang the pictures side by side, it's like the corner of the robe just swallows up the flood. Such is the mighty power of the Lord. As I've been thinking through how to apply this psalm, I've been wrestling with whether the floods are speaking of a specific thing or whether they're speaking more generally. There's lots of biblical imagery of floods 
We think of Noah, the great flood, the Red Sea. We find the idea of waters and turmoil represented, uh, representing chaos. In Isaiah, Assyria described, are actually described as roaring floods crashing down upon Israel. But it seems that the psalmist doesn't pin the image down, but rather is making a general contrast between the unsettling power of the floods and the mighty power of the Lord who rules them. This is a psalm to refocus our attention on the reality that the Lord reigns in all seasons, whatever the floods may be. But as we've said, because it's a psalm for all times, it is a psalm for specific times. Specific times in the lives of each of God's people, specific times in the life of his church. There are situations in our lives personally and as a church which may feel overwhelming, that leave us feeling we are up to our neck. And they may be big things, or they may be seemingly small things, but they build up and they build up. In verse 3, the floods appear, they speak, they roar. Psalm 93 counsels us to tell the Lord and to look at the robes and to remember that the Lord, the covenant-keeping God, reigns. He is in control, full of mercy, faithful to his promises, belt on and active, mightier than the crashing waves. It is a psalm for all times. It is a psalm for us to use often. But it was also a psalm applied in book four here to that specific situation of the Israelites. At their lowest point in exile, what did they need to remember? The very same thing. The Lord reigns. They needed to be galvanized to look to him alone for rescue. And it strikes me that the psalm picks up lots of imagery that would have taken their minds back to the great work of rescue in the Exodus. There seem to be lots of connections here to Moses' song in Exodus chapter 15. As he stood on the banks of the Red Sea, Moses recalled the Lord's work rescuing his people from slavery in Egypt and leading them safely through the waters. And both this psalm and Moses' song, well, they pick up on the Lord as being ready for battle. They vividly describe his might and his power. Both describe his power over roaring waves. Exodus 15, verse 8. Moses says, At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up, the floods stood up in a pile, the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The Lord, mightier than the thunder of many waters. And Moses' song concludes with the declaration, the Lord will reign forever and ever. See, the Lord, mighty to win victory over his enemies, mighty to bring salvation to his people, mighty to reign forever and ever. And so Moses, standing on the shore of the sea, where he looks at the water that has swept in judgment over the enemies, that was parted, as God's people were saved, and he praises him. Psalm 93 galvanizes Israel to look again to the same Lord for rescue. In our first reading in Hebrews Hebrews 1, there is a quote from Psalm 2. You are my son, today I have begotten you. This is speaking of Jesus Christ, the Lord's anointed king. And he is the one who brings refuge from the flood of judgment that we all deserve from our rebellion against God. He defeated the ultimate enemies of sin and death. And indeed, Jesus himself uses the imagery of the flood to call us to listen to him and to come to him and to trust him for that rescue. Listen to his words in Luke chapter 6. Jesus says, Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against the house and could not shake it 
because it had been well built. All who come to Jesus, the Lord's anointed one, who listen to his words and respond to them are safe from the flood of judgment. On the cross, he carried our sin. He bore the flood of judgment in our place and has risen to victory, mighty to save. He has done it. Hebrews 1 again tells us, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus, the anointed king, the radiance of the glory of God has done it. And so like Moses, every Christian can stand as it were on the seashore and praise the Lord for his mighty work of salvation. The Lord mighty to save from the flood of judgment for all who come to him. Well, how much more therefore is he able to bring us through any flood that roars in the trouble and the turmoil of life to the specific opposition that God's people face. Look at the robes. The Lord reigns. For those here this morning who have not turned to the Lord, to his son Jesus Christ, the reality is there is a flood of judgment awaiting for all who do not acknowledge the Lord reigns. We all deserve it for the way we fail to honour the Lord who reigns. But if we recognise the waters are thundering, well, we find as we come to him, a Lord who is merciful and gracious and mighty to save, who sent his son for you and pushed back the waters like the Red Sea to lead you to safety. The question is, will you trust him and will you follow him through? The Lord reigns, so we are safe in the flood. And finally, as we draw to a close, the Lord reigns, we are safe in the flood and strengthened to serve him. Have a look at verse five. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. The final verse in this psalm, well, it strengthens us to take the next step when the flood comes. It's so hard to know what to do, isn't it? But the psalm says, the Lord reigns. And verse 5 assures us we really can trust his promises. When we don't know what will happen next, well, we can take the next step according to his word, knowing that the world is established by him. And when we do that, we know we are lining up with the decrees of the creator, of the one whose word does not fail. In comparison to the many floods each of us will face at different times, I want to share with you an example from this week that has, I've been thinking this through. Um, it feels trivial, really, but it's one of the many little ways this psalm has been impacting on me. We've moved house this week, and in the chaos of unpacking and preparing for this morning and various other things going on, this psalm has helped me to look up, to consider the robes, and then to step forward. What do I do when the competing needs and tasks arise and there are boxes everywhere and I've no idea where my umbrella is? Well, rather than despair, or rather than default to sinful grumpiness, I can look at the robes. The Lord reigns. He is in control even over this and his decrees are faithful. And so I can step forward. I can trust his promises. His mercies are new every morning. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all you need will be given to you. He will sustain me and he calls me to serve. And so I can take the next step. In the unpacking mayhem, perhaps that first step is to go and apologize for grumpiness and step forward in the next act of service. As we come out of uh, the summer as well, it strikes me that many here will be returning to workplaces in person more and more in the coming months. And it just may be that more of that face-to-face -face time in the workplace, well, it just brings pressures to dishonor Jesus that we haven't faced for a while in Zoom land. Well, again, when the flood raises its voice, look at the robes. The Lord reigns. In fact, 
What seem like crashing waves to us, to the Lord, really are like rippling breakers on the seaside round the ankles. We can take the next step. His promises will not fail you. And when the flood is deeper or it seems unrelenting, it may feel overwhelming. Well, the Lord has not changed. He still reigns and his decrees remain faithful. Take the next step. Well, finally, did you notice in verse 5, this is also a corporate thing? The last few lines, holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. The psalm speaks of the Lord's house. In its original context, that would have been the temple. And because of who he is, well, only holiness is fitting for his house. Having reflected on the Lord who reigns, you can imagine the Israelites strengthened in their service, motivated, empowered to serve the Lord with holiness in his house. Well, the New Testament tells us that God's house is no longer a physical temple, but a physical people, the church. Not St. Helens the building, but St. Helens the people, united and brought together by the work of Jesus, who by on his by his death on the cross, made us holy, no longer facing the waters of judgment. And there will be times when the waves of opposition attack the church. There will be pressure to conform to culture or to deny the Lord himself and what he has said in his word. Psalm 93 galvanizes us to keep walking in his ways, trusting his word and seeking to live it out, adorning his house with holiness. It's striking that verses 1 and verses 4 in this psalm are declarations to one another. If we were to read this out together, well, we would be reading out to one another and declaring, the Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty, he is mighty. When the floods come, it can sometimes feel like a very small thing to bring the encouragement to one another that the Lord reigns. Don't we know that already? Oh no, it's such a valuable thing. We don't do it glibly, but as a church, we need to remind one another that it is true. So that we know we are secure as his people and that we are strengthened to keep walking his ways, trusting his word and adorning his house with holiness. Let's pray together. The Lord reigns. Heavenly Father, please take this psalm and please use it to grow our conviction that you really reign over your world in mighty power and total commitment to your promises. Help us, we pray, to trust you, to look to you, and to keep walking in your ways. Amen.